9-11-2001. Four planes change America and the world forever. 19 men armed with box cutter knives strike a stunning blow against the mightiest superpower on the planet. Now investigators must discover how the multi-billion dollar security apparatus of the US military, intelligence and aviation authorities could be totally blindsided by a simple plot that exploits fatal gaps in their defenses. Disasters don't just happen. They are triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the fateful decisions in those final seconds from disaster. The United States. New York, Griffiths Air Force Base. September 11th, 2001, 7 a.m. America prepares for war. Operation Vigilant Guardian will simulate an attack coming in from across the nation's borders. We have periodic air defense exercises. Uh, you can call them war games, if you will. Colonel. Air Force Colonel Bob Ma is in charge of the Northeast Air Defense Sector. He's responsible for two and a half million square kilometers of airspace, covering Washington, D.C. and New York in the east, all the way past Chicago in the middle of the country. We practice all of our procedures so that if we ever did have to go to war, obviously, we've been well prepared. Ma doesn't know what form today's training will take. His team has to be ready to deal with any conceivable threat from outside America. 400 kilometers away, five passengers are already checking in at Boston Logan Airport. Just can I ask you a few questions? They're booked on American Airlines Flight 11 to Los Angeles. Automated screening selects three of the men for additional scrutiny, but all five pass through checks without incident. American Airlines Flight 11 will be one of over 5,000 commercial flights in the skies within the next hour. And the man in charge of keeping them all on track is Ben Sliney. He's worked in air traffic control for 30 years, but today is his first as National Operations Manager for the Federal Aviation Administration. I was given charge of the nation's airspace. I'm feeling pretty good uh, on the first day uh, of that job. 7.59 a.m. American Airlines Flight 11 climbs into the Boston skies. Its route to L.A. will take it due west. Looking after the economy class cabin is number three flight attendant, Betty Ong. With the flight only half full, the trip should be fairly relaxed. Colonel Bob Maher and his team are on standby for their air defense exercise. They're totally unaware of the events beginning on American Flight 11. minutes after takeoff. American 11 Boston, this is Boston, do you hear me? Boston Air Traffic Control loses radio contact with the flight. Uh, American 11 Boston, is Boston, can you hear me? Despite multiple attempts to contact the crew for 10 minutes, there's no response. With thousands of flights in the sky every day, this is not an unusual occurrence. But at 8.24, air traffic control overhear an in-flight announcement from the pilot's cabin. We have a complaint that take flight at the crew, right into the airport. The message is clearly intended for passengers only. 
and it's immediately interpreted as suspicious by an air traffic controller in Boston. 828. The report comes to Ben Sliney. Our experience with a hijack uh, is they usually ended benignly, and I wasn't overly concerned about the fact that a, a hijack had occurred. 8.34 a.m. On board, Betty Ong, in desperation, has managed to contact her airline, calling the reservation center in Raleigh, North Carolina. My name is Betty Ong. I'm number three on flight 11. I think we're getting hijacked. Can anybody get up to the cockpit? No. The cockpit is not answering their phone, and the door won't open. We don't know who's up there. And um, our number one has been stabbed, and our five has been stabbed. 8.35. The plane is not responding to air traffic controllers. And for the last few minutes, it's been deviating from its route towards New York. At the ATC Center on Long Island, Dave Bottiglia is looking after Sector 42 of New York airspace. I said, oh, this is going to be a great day. The Sector 42 is not busy on nice days. As soon as I sat down, Boston Center calls up and he says, this is American 11. He goes, watch him, they think he's hijacked. But the hijackers have switched off the plane's transponder meaning Bottiglia doesn't know its speed and altitude. He only has the primary radar blip. We're just tracking him. He's heading down towards Kennedy. We know that he's off course. And that was the only thing that we really knew. 8.38 a.m. Unnerved by the radio silence, another controller calls the military's northeast air defense sector. Is there any military assistance requested? The request is so unusual, it reaches Colonel Mark. The military think it could be part of the training scenario that they're expecting. It's unique for the line controller to request military assistance. They would normally have to pass through the FAA command lines. The request for help from an air traffic controller might be irregular, but Ma takes it deadly seriously. We took immediate action by putting the fighters at uh, Otis Air National Guard Base on alert. Otis Air Force Base, Massachusetts, is 250 kilometers northeast of New York City. Where, in a bid to trace the missing flight over New York State, Dave Bottiglia contacts another flight in the area. Please change transponder. I said, do you see an American flight off your left? And he says, we saw him before, when we got him in sight. We no longer see him. The last reported sighting of American Airlines Flight 11 is just north of Manhattan, New York City. 8.43 a.m. On board American 11, flight attendant Betty Ong has been doing her best to let people on the ground know what's happening on the plane. I can't get into the cockpit. Is anybody still there? We are, absolutely. You're doing a great job. Just, just stay calm, okay, Betty? What's going on, honey? Okay. Aircraft is erratic again. It's driving very erratic. American Airlines Flight 11 crashes into the North Tower of the World Trade Center, hitting the building between the 93rd and 99th floors. 
8.50. Four minutes after impact. At the FAA command center, Ben Sliney is still unaware of what's happened in New York. One of the military liaisons indicated to me that CNN was reporting that a small aircraft had struck the World Trade Center. Frank? Yes, sir? Can you get me that up on the screen right now? Yeah, right I need away. to see that TV. This, Justin, you are looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center. We have unconfirmed reports this morning. The first thing that I saw was a huge conflagration. And in my mind, of course, I knew that could not be a small aircraft. I have in my gut a bad feeling about what I'm looking at. 8.51 a.m. With no official word that the plane involved is the passenger airliner American 11, the military send the two F-15 fighter jets to look around for the missing flight. At air traffic control on Long Island, Dave Battilia is concerned about another flight, United Airlines Flight 175. The transponder code has already changed, and now it too is flying erratically. I look up, and right at that particular time, I notice now that United 175 has taken a really fast rate of climb. I actually got scared at that point. I turned to the chief, and I said, I think I have another one. 9 a.m. The U.S. Air Force's F-15s are still over 100 kilometers away, attempting to track down American 11. Now, United 175 begins a terrifying descent. We saw it, and somebody in the area was actually counting it out now. 6,000, 4,000, 2,000, and they said the next hit, he's in the ground. And then somebody screamed out, oh my God, that's the Royal Trade Center there. Oh, there's another one, another plane just hit. <gasps> right, oh my God, they hit another building. Flew right into the middle of it. Explosion. My God, it's right in the middle of the building. At 9.03, Flight 175 hits the South Tower. spreads around lower Manhattan. Colonel Bob Maher is shocked to see the reports from the live television news. At that point, our entire mindset shifted. Now New York is under attack. This is no war game. It's the real thing. He sends the F-15s direct to Manhattan. Whatever altitude they need to go for center to make that work is fine with me. But uh, so that's the area I want them to go in home. 904. At the FAA command center, Ben Sliney, on his first day as national operations manager, faces an unimaginable challenge. Now all aircraft in the sky were becoming suspicious to me. Immediately, I ordered a national ground stop order, meaning that no aircraft in the nation could now take off and join our airspace. 9.05 a.m. Primary radar picks up American Airline Flight 77 en route from Washington to L.A., and it's miles off course. 11 minutes earlier, the flight had begun to turn away from its planned route when it switched off its transponder and radio contact was lost. Now, just a blip on radar screens. The flight has turned back east, heading towards the nation's capital. The F-15 fighter jets reach Manhattan it's now a scene of devastation. At the same time, 500 kilometers away, at Langley Air Force Base, Virginia, another two fighter jets, F-16s, are deployed in the hunt for Flight 11. At 9.32, American Flight 77 is still heading east towards the nation's capital. 
we had 11 reports of hijacked aircraft in the area. And so we're trying to determine which ones were more credible and which ones weren't. That's when we said about the best we can do is, is assume that perhaps Washington, D.C. is going to be a target. Only at 9.36, when they are 240 kilometers from Washington, D.C., are the jets vectored towards American 77 and Washington airspace. AM. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, we're looking at a uh, live picture from Washington and there is smoke pouring out of the Pentagon. Seeing America's defense HQ in flames, Ben Sliney takes decisive action. Three was just too much to bear uh, and not do something about it. I can't physically uh, control all the aircraft, but I can certainly eliminate all the aircraft from the sky. This is Ben Sliney, head of ATC. That was the point at which uh, I gave the order to land all aircraft at the nearest airport, regardless of their destination. Over 4,000 aircraft in American airspace all begin to land. It's an unprecedented move. It did cross through my mind that, of course, they could fire me for that but I didn't really give that a lot of thought. Even as flights are landing, by 9.44, air traffic controllers have spotted a fourth plane, United 93, start to follow an ominous pattern. United 93 had deviated from its route of flight and had changed its transponder code. Heading from Newark to San Francisco, the flight had been contacted 20 minutes earlier by United Ground Staff, warning the pilots of possible intrusions into the cockpit. 9.59. At the World Trade Center. Oh, there it goes, there it goes, there it goes, there it goes. The 110-story South Tower collapses. traffic controllers are now trying to work out if United 93 has been hijacked. Even at that late juncture, there was a possibility that it was an electrical failure on United 93, and the aircraft was trying to get to an airport to land, and yet had no communication whatsoever. Sliney can only track the plane as it appears to head for the Washington, D.C. area. The U.S. Air Force F-16s rushed to set up a defensive patrol above the nation's capital. As we were watching United 93, we received a report from an aircraft in the area of a large smoke plume emanating from the ground. We made the presumption that that, air that aircraft had struck the ground in uh, western Pennsylvania. The plane comes down, just 20 minutes flying time short of Washington, D.C. All 44 passengers and crew are killed. These are the first pictures we have in. Initial reports indicated uh, no survivors. 25 minutes later, in downtown Manhattan, The North Tower of the World Trade Center collapses. In the space of just 102 minutes, the four hijacked planes have claimed the lives of almost 3,000 people. And before the dust settles, the largest criminal investigation in American history begins. There are literally thousands of leads for the FBI counterterrorism team to chase down. Evidence scattered across three crash sites. 
But when the first major breakthrough comes, it's far from the scenes of devastation. Ken Maxwell is one of the senior FBI agents in Manhattan. Mohammed Atta, uh, who had uh, flown on uh, American Flight 11, had left his bag, not intentionally, his bag did not make the connecting flight from Portland, Maine. That bag was a treasure trove of uh, information and evidence that directly identified him as, as a main player. Using this information, it takes a network of thousands of FBI special agents only 72 hours to piece together a web of 19 suspected hijackers. All are linked to a sworn enemy of the United States, Al-Qaeda, and the group's leader, Osama bin Laden. But how did the most sophisticated security network in the world fail to confront this well-known threat and prevent the hijackings and their tragic consequences? Now, by rewinding the events of that day and by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal the catalog of errors that left America wide open to the most devastating attack on U.S. soil in the nation's history. Just over a year after the attacks, Thank you all for coming. Please be seated. President George W. Bush sets up the 9-11 Commission. Today I sign an act of Congress authorizing a national commission to investigate the events of September the 11th. A senior counsel to the 9-11 Commission, John Farmer is tasked to investigate the events of the day in forensic detail. You can't be in law enforcement as long as I was uh, and not have 9-11 affect you pretty deeply. I remember thinking at the end of that day, what just happened? Um, and, uh, and that question really haunted me. The United States spends billions on military and intelligence systems to safeguard the nation. And it falls to John Farmer to question whether those systems could have stopped the 9-11 plotters. Almost two years before the attack, a CIA surveillance operation in the Yemen establishes that two of the hijackers, Al-Midhar and Al-Hazmi, have strong terrorist connections. Midhar's family's phone had been intercepted, so there was solid information linking Midhar to uh, Al-Qaeda and Hazmi to Midhar. Some months later, the CIA eventually tracked Midhar to Dubai. Agents break into his hotel room. They discover that Midhar has a visa which enables him to enter and exit the United States at will. Within days, they are tracked to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, where one of the pair is photographed at an Al-Qaeda meeting. There had been a meeting in Malaysia that had been surveilled. And then they lost the trail. Up to this point, the system has worked. The CIA has identified a foreign threat to the United States. But until Midhar's in the USA, the CIA maintain an exclusive interest in him and will not share classified details of his case. This lack of communication between agencies is not an oversight. It's a matter of policy. There was the wall, the so-called wall, where agents who were involved in intelligence gathering uh, were uh, separated from agents involved in law enforcement. Before 9-11, the wall is there because evidence gathered from intelligence surveillance, or spying, is perceived as inadmissible in a U.S. court of law. But the way that it actually worked was the wall became an excuse not to share information. 19 months before the 9-11 attacks, Al-Midhar and Al-Hazmi move into an apartment in San Diego, California. The CIA are aware that Al-Midhar and Al-Hazmi are in the country, but they're not tracking the men's precise movements. That would be a job for the FBI, 
but the Bureau doesn't even know the pair are in America. And for over a year, the two move unhindered around the US. So there's another, there's another sort of bureaucratic fault line there. Uh, if it, things had been working really smoothly, uh, the FBI would have known to look for them too, um, but didn't. Um, and, and so when they come to the United States, they come in unnoticed. It's not the only missed opportunity that the commission uncovers. Three months before the 9-11 attacks, a critical point comes at a specially convened intelligence meeting between the CIA and the FBI, analyzing previous terrorist attacks. CIA agents show their FBI counterparts photographs of Al-Qaeda connections that include Al-Midha. The FBI want to know more. Because of the wall, the FBI is not told certain important things to the great frustration uh, of the FBI agents. Even though dedicated individuals see a threat, the systems in place make it near impossible for them to combat it effectively. There's a famous email that one of the FBI agents sends saying, at some point there'll be bodies in the streets and at that point nobody's gonna care that there was this wall. They're just gonna know that we didn't do anything. 14 days to disaster. The FBI's own sources tell them of the potential threat of an Al-Qaeda attack, and the FBI conducts its own investigation. We knew something was being planned by Al-Qaeda, and, uh, and they were known uh, Al-Qaeda uh, operatives. Two men with known links to Al-Qaeda are in the United States, but the CIA still isn't sharing intelligence on them. With nothing to go on, the FBI's manhunt for the pair is just one of hundreds of avenues of investigation and has just one agent allocated to it. al Midha and Al-Hazmi are not found. Knowing that these people were residing in the United States would have been of tremendous investigative interest to the FBI. September 11th, 2001 two hours from disaster. Five men check into American Airlines Flight 11, bound for Los Angeles. Three of them are flagged by the computer-assisted passenger pre-screening system, or CAPS. The computerized algorithm uses factors such as age, nationality, and travel records to identify potentially high-risk individuals. If a passenger is selected by the CAP system for scrutiny, um, it involved on that day a, a more deeply searching um, questioning of his itinerary and where he's going, potentially what his bags are containing. None of the hijackers are on the FAA's no-fly list, which would bar them from getting on the plane. And several of the hijackers board the plane carrying box cutter knives on their person or in their hand luggage. There were regulations uh, about the blade length. It was less than four inches, for example. It was not considered to be necessarily a dangerous weapon. Over the next 45 minutes, 14 more hijackers check into three more flights at cities across the northeast US. Three more of them are picked up by caps and several of the hijackers are also carrying knives. And yet, all of them are allowed to board their flights. You have to understand that the procedures that were in place didn't contemplate hijackers who would try to destroy the plane. Previously, hijackers had taken over passenger airliners to win a bargaining position, not for suicide missions. Nobody is prepared for a deadly airborne attack. And once on the flights, it was a simple matter for the hijackers to take over the planes. Thirty-two minutes before first impact, the hijackers make their move. If the hijackers demanded entry to the cockpit, the protocol at that point was open the door, let them in. The theory was we don't want to risk anyone's life. 
Again, the theory doesn't allow for a suicide mission. The 19 hijackers take over four passenger jets and turn them into guided missiles. From this moment, there is nothing any airline or air traffic controller can do to stop them. The last line of defense is seemingly the US military, the biggest, best equipped air force in the world. But if they're going to act, they have to know that there is a threat. So John Farmer's investigation looks into the process of how the military become involved in a hijack. And there was an existing hijacking protocol by which the military would be contacted uh, and um, potentially fighter jets would be scrambled. Going by the book, air traffic controllers had to contact the FAA controllers in Washington. Then, a chain of communications would follow before authority to scramble jets could be given. Had this protocol occurred on 9-11, the fighter jets could still have been sitting on the tarmac long after the fourth plane had crashed. They essentially ditched that protocol that day. Nine minutes to disaster. Farmer discovers that unlike the bureaucracy that hampered the CIA and FBI, ATC threw away the rulebook. An air traffic controller was so concerned, he called direct to a local air base in Rome, New York. Yes, one second. Colonel Bob Ma has to handle the situation. The first call we got was from the line controller at Boston Center saying, I've got a problem here and I need more help. I'm going to go to the military and get it. Eight minutes to disaster. The military have been notified, but that doesn't trigger an automatic armed response. Ma still requires an order from a superior officer before he can scramble planes. The prompt actions of the quick-thinking air traffic controller hit the brick wall of military bureaucracy. My hat's off to him because he was taking an initiative that really wasn't reflected a lot of the way up the chain later on. Ma waits for authorization. Minutes later, he consults with his immediate superior and they agree they can't wait any longer. The order to scramble planes came from Rome, New York, and the commander in Rome said, I'll get the authorization from above later. We have to do this now. Seconds to disaster. Ma orders two jets to scramble. Since the end of the Cold War, America's rapid response force has been reduced just four jets are on standby to defend half of America's east coast. The nearest are at Otis Air Force Base on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, 250 kilometers from New York City. As the first passenger airliner flies into the World Trade Center, the pilots are still waiting for the all clear. The F-15s only take off from Otis seven minutes after the first attack hits. Farmer then examines how the military respond to the unfolding attacks, minute by minute. What he finds is extraordinary. Even after the first impact, Nobody in authority yet knew that it was American 11 that had flown into the North Tower. Even if it was still in the air, finding American 11 was going to be a problem for the military. Military radar was set up to look far beyond U.S. borders for potential threats, not to track civilian planes. They were never a perceived threat. So any fighter pilot looking for a passenger jet would need to be guided by the civilian air traffic controllers. The procedure demanded close cooperation between two very different organizations. There's a bit of communication uh, issue because the agencies really weren't used to working together. 
Some of our phones, we couldn't dial long distance. We were used to dialing military numbers. We needed to talk to so many different people now that we had to create new communications lines. 9 a.m. The two F-15s are closing in on New York City. The thought of anyone flying a hijacked plane on a suicide mission still isn't computing. It was just inconceivable that a, a, a plane would actually uh, be flown into a building. So we continued our efforts to try to locate the flight. One minute to second impact. The authorities continue to respond to confusing reports of the first crashed plane, American 11, still flying in or around New York City. We got American Airlines, Airlines 11. We think we might have them just uh, east of uh, New York. They thought they had found it. it was, they thought it, they were tracking it down the Hudson River, and then it vanished. The F-15 fighter jets are still along the coast, looking for a plane that no longer exists. And now, the second hijacked passenger jet, United 175, is about to hit the Twin Towers. Actually, we don't realize there's another problem until we pretty much see it on TV, believe it or not. Now, America knows without question, it is under direct attack. At this point, the national command structure, senior politicians and the military should spring into action. News reports on the day itself and in the weeks following suggest that a coordinated response is instantly triggered and that it comes close to foiling the next attacks. What had been told to the public was that the first two planes um, came as a shock, um, and the, the planes hit the Trade Center. But by the third flight, um, the national command structure had reasserted itself, had responded to the shock. They had scrambled planes in response to the report that the third plane, American 77, was heading for Washington, uh, and and was just just too late to intercept that flight. In the months after 9/11. This remains the official line on the third hijacked plane. But the 9-11 Commission reveals the true picture. Different layers of government started talking to themselves. The president started talking to the vice president, Richard Clark from the White House. He had a video conference call with people at his level in the various agencies. Uh, the problem was no one was talking between those different levels. Without decisive leadership from the national command structure, the people on the ground are left to do their best. What we found was that there was no report to the military that American 77, the third plane, was hijacked at all. They had a report shortly before it crashed that it was missing, and they had a report shortly before it crashed that there was an unidentified plane somewhere near the Pentagon. But there was no report that American 77 had, in fact, been hijacked. When it comes to United 93, the fourth hijacked plane, the official line that the authorities were in control of the situation is even stronger. It was on radar. They had the authorizations they needed to intercept the plane and, if necessary, take it down. But as John Farmer reviews the military's recordings, a different story comes to light. Farmer's investigation discovers that at the highest levels of authority, no one was taking decisions relevant to the situation on the ground. From the perspective of the command center and myself, there was no one in the nation who knew what was going on. The truth of that day is that the national command structure was irrelevant at the critical time period. The terrible truth of 9-11 is that the only people making a difference were the civilians on the front line, the ATC and the crews and passengers aboard the hijacked planes, the last line of defense. We can now reveal the series of critical failures that allowed this terrorist attack on American soil to happen. 20 months from disaster, two suspected Al-Qaeda activists moved to California. 
But a lack of communication between intelligence agencies means the FBI don't even know they're in the country. 14 days from disaster. The FBI begins a manhunt, but it's too little, too late. Two hours from disaster. At three separate airports across the east coast of the US, 19 hijackers check in for flights. A few are selected for extra scrutiny, but all are allowed to board their planes with weapons easily to hand. 32 minutes from disaster. On American Airlines Flight 11, the hijackers use their weapons to take control of the plane. Nine minutes from disaster. The only meaningful response to the hijacking comes from the Boston Air Traffic Controller, who immediately bypasses normal protocols and contacts the military directly. Three minutes from disaster. As the authorities struggle to find American 11, Betty Ong struggles to pass information to people on the ground, but it goes nowhere. Seconds from disaster. Air Force Colonel Bob Ma takes a gamble and scrambles two F-15 fighter jets from Otis Air Base, but it's too late. At 8.46, American Airlines Flight 11 plows into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. 17 minutes later, at 9.03 a.m., Flight 175 crashes into the South Tower. Flight 77 hits the Pentagon at 9.37, 51 minutes after first impact. The only thing that stops the hijackers on United Airlines Flight 93 is the heroic effort of the passengers and crew. Their struggle ends with a final crash in a field outside Pittsburgh at 10.03. The institutions that should have protected America were unable to cope with a threat they had never imagined. Vital information wasn't shared between agencies. It's almost unfair to single out, you know, a particular agency because one person in the FBI knew X, one person in CIA knew Y, one person in NSA knew Z. I think it was a failure of government as a whole. Every government agency struggled without accurate information. We did not know what was going on. We never, did, we never could figure it out. And without precise direction, the military was powerless to intervene. There was not enough time to do what we needed to do. The fighters were not able to shoot down because they were never within range of any of any aircraft to shoot down. Almost 3,000 people died on September the 11th, 2001. This really relatively simple attack thwarted every expensive system that we had in place. I think that's why it was such a shock. Since the tragedy of 9-11, every government agency involved has made sweeping changes. Intelligence agencies have been forced to work more closely together. Airport security has been tightened. Military and civilian radar and air traffic operations have been merged to talk in one language. But it remains to be seen whether all the lessons have been learned and America is safe. I think we have better intelligence than we did um, but that does not uh, mean that we are um, protected against the next curveball, whatever it might be. Don't miss American Weed Mile High Showdown, brand new and back-to-back, -back, this Friday night from 8. Second from Disaster is back after the break.